TB Schenke has been around for 150 years this year. We are in 2,100 locations approximately. 75,000 people work for DB Schenke and our main business units are land transport, air ocean, contract logistics and general logistics uh, management. It's a fascinating field and IT is in the heart of a lot of this. Automation is a driver for change of innovation and all that, but it also obviously is a cost factor. The more we can automate menial tasks, the more we can free up our employees to actually do more of the value adding tasks. And then the challenges are not to over automate, like to automate those processes where it actually makes sense. Yeah. So pragmatically look, where does it make sense? And where is it sufficient to just, you know, optimize the process itself? This is CRNet TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today with Krista Kunen, who's the CIO, CDO, and member of the board of DB Schenker. A very warm welcome, Krista. Thank you very much. Krista, you have a master from the Albert Ludwigs University in Freiburg. You have an MBA from the SA Business School in Barcelona. You worked 17 years at Deutsche Bahn and you joined DB Schenker in 2021 as CIO, CDO member of the board. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Who are you? Uh, what's your background and how did you arrive in this position? I'd be happy to, thank you very much. So I'm from Bad Homburg originally, that's uh, close to Frankfurt, that's where I grew up and went to school. Mm -hmm. And after school I studied economics in Mainz first, um, for my, I suppose, equivalent to a BA, and then went on to Freiburg to get my master's in economics. Mm -hmm. And after that, my first real job after two or three longer internships was uh, for a Swedish direct marketing company selling uh, these collectible recipe cards through the mail. Um, so I did a trainee program with them in Sweden and then moved to Paris uh, to work as a product manager there. And after that, I then moved from Paris to Barcelona to do my MBA, which was a lot of fun since Barcelona is a fantastic city. Not that Paris isn't either, of course it is, but studying is always a slightly different time of life than when you're actually working. Yep. So I did my MBA there and then moved to London to work in uh, strategy consulting for a small strategy consulting company called Parthenon mm -hmm. and did that for almost three years before returning back to Germany and joining Deutsche Bahn Okay. And then uh, working in quite a few different positions throughout Deutsche Bahn, mm -hmm. uh, first in also strategy, doing projects, then slowly moved towards uh, the finance area and spent uh, quite a few years in finance, first as like a head of controlling for the services area mm -hmm. and later then as CFO in two of the companies, uh, the second company being the IT company. And then I became the CEO in that IT company. Then uh, a bit later on, they also made me CIO of all of Deutsche Bahn. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I moved over to Schenken. Okay, so quite an international parkour. And you have an international background, I understand. Your mother is American. Correct. Uh, and you went from marketing to finance to different areas of the business and then ended up in IT. So quite a career. And so DB Schenker now. Um, so you're here for a couple of months. Uh, tell us in a couple of sentences, what does DB Schenker stand for? What do they do? And what is it that DB Schenker does really, really well? DB Schenker has been around for 150 years this year. So we've been elevating lives for 150 years, founded in Vienna in 1872. And uh, we are today in 2,100 locations, approximately 75,000 people work for DB Schenker. And our main business units are uh, land transport, air ocean, contract logistics and general uh, logistics uh, management. And we also do uh, quite a lot in sort of uh, fairs and exhibitions, special transports and things like that. So very broad logistics mm -hmm. footprint and a very global company. We are, I believe, number one in land transport in Europe mm -hmm. and also have uh, quite leading positions in air ocean, uh, but also in contract logistics uh, overall. So big organization, 75,000 people, global presence, so many different offices and so on. So, so what, are the, what are the drivers for change uh, uh, today? I mean, all our companies are under a lot of pressure uh, to transform the, themselves, to reinvent themselves. So what's going on here at DB Schenker? What drives the change? What drives the transformation? What, and therefore also dri drives IT uh, at the moment? Mm. I think you can look at that question from two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I believe that in a 
organization that's successful, it's always also the employees that drive change. Mm -hmm. So I can see everywhere inside Schenker are very motivated employees looking at what does this company need to really excel for our customers, to really move forward in our market. And that drives a lot of the change, a lot of the, the new innovative topics and all that. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I mean, look at the last almost two years now, the logistics market was very, very strongly impacted by the COVID situation worldwide. Yeah. So a lot of things changed and we had to adapt very quickly to changing needs, to a changing environment, changing capacities and so on and so on. So obviously that was a big driver for us to actually adapt to that, to actually make sure that we were able to, to up our capacities, that we were able to deal with this constant change of environment. Yeah. And I think we managed extremely successfully. So for us, that is also an impetus for change, not just in the moment, but also looking at how we can use that success and future-proof it and make sure that we continue that on forward. Yeah. The pandemic has really been an accelerator for change, I, I think, and, and especially the way that we work. And not only people working from home, uh, office people working from home, so uh, much, much more than, uh, than before, but I think we're redesigning the way that we work. We're reinventing uh, the way that, that we organize our work um, because of the pandemic, but, but, but also I think because there's a a new uh, generation of software tools available. So let's talk a little bit about the enterprise automation tools uh, that are out there today and how you use them today. So can you tell us a little bit where are you in that journey? Where are you with RPA, with software robots, with artificial intelligence and so on? Well, we've been on that journey for a couple of years since you know automation is a driver for change for of innovation and all that but it also obviously is a cost factor the more we can automate menial tasks the more we can free up our employees to actually do more of the value adding tasks so it's been a, quite the focus for the past couple of years mm -hmm. and we we look at uh, i mean if you look at logistics there are a lot a lot a lot of paper based processes yeah. i mean just still, traditionally still, still obviously still today and very traditionally and also there are so many different interfaces between customers, the companies that are sending the goods, us, and all sorts of different interfaces. Yeah. So there's a lot of, if you do all that manually, there's a lot of margin for error there. So we started off looking at the actual processes, like sort of customer facing, looking at how can we automate everything around them getting the correct proof of delivery, getting their billing quickly and all that. So um, that's one of the big areas of automation that we started off with. Currently, we have about 150 plus use cases mm -hmm. um, that are ongoing in the RPA field yep. and uh, all over, like globally, all over the world in production. Uh, so that's just one example of it. But we also have our chatbot Betty, especially here in Europe. And uh, I think it's eight different countries now uh, actually active and live, though mm -hmm. I think it's seven countries in Europe plus in Singapore. Internally, we use Betty. So that's a different type of automation and using AI to actually be able to respond to customer queries, at least to the simpler ones in a much more timely manner. But for us, automation then obviously, and also actual robotics, extends into our production much more because we look at warehouse automation as one of the big drivers of productivity uh, using different aspects of robotics and robots inside the warehouses for picking, for labeling, for example, but also uh, automating uh, forklifts and things like that. Um, and we look at autonomous driving, obviously, being in, in uh, uh, the logistics space and look at how can we use that to also optimize our operations and drive that forward in different countries. So a perfect uh, category, a perfect company to do a lot of automation. Some people say that typical back office processes across industries, that you could uh, automate them, uh, uh, at least 30% of them. Do you agree with that? Do you also see that? And, and where do you, uh, would you picture yourself today and how much progress could you still make in automating these uh, traditional, these more yeah, uh, manual labor processes and so on? 
I would actually almost tend to disagree because I think 30% is a bit low. Okay. I think if you actually look at the back office processes mm -hmm. and go forward, who knows how many years, that's a bit up for discussion. But I think that probably the percentage at the end of the day, if you really were radical with this automation, could be quite a lot higher than those 30%. Where are we today on that? We do have uh, quite a few processes that we at minimum piloted or locally automated in that area. I think we still have quite a lot of potential to now scale that up yep. and to, to be slightly more structured after the first phase of innovation and actually pushing it out there to really go big on the more global processes and all that. So we're on that journey, yep. uh, but by far not where we want to be. Okay. Now, the first and, and, and foremost, I, I would think, reason to do this is cost optimization. But could you, can you also use these, these concepts and these tools for innovation? Can you do new things with this? I think it's um, obviously cost optimization, but it's also uh, increasing the quality that's one big thing that I see as well, because with yeah. all these man manual processes, there's too much margin for human error. Yeah. Um, it is also freeing up our people to be able to, to use their time more for the value add things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this automation is innovation because you look at, I mean, you look at it, you see issues in the organization, you see things that don't work well, mm -hmm. and then you look at how can you use technology in an innovative way to actually solve those problems. Some of it is then automation, but before the automation, you obviously look at, are these processes even logical? Do we need to change the underlying processes? Yeah. And how can we combine different things through technical means? So I, I think it's an absolute driver for innovation and a driver, not just necessarily technical innovation, but also work process innovation, uh, working together and all these things. So it definitely drives change and innovation. And is it easy to find these processes? I mean, you have to go and look for them or is the business coming to you and say, are they, are they demanding that you automate these? How, how does that work with the business? Definitely the business is looking at where do they feel pain and where do the customers feel pain and then come and say, hey, we want to automate. Either give us the tools so we can do it or help us automate. Yeah. And depending on the size of the issue, it is either the business driving forward the automation or us helping coordinate it and drive the automation if it's slightly bigger or needs to be connected uh, with interfaces to too many other applications. Yeah. So you say you have already done um, quite some work, but there's still a lot of work to, to be done. And, and what are the, the major challenges to accelerate this and to implement to a maximum the, the, the new automation uh, platforms and systems? Major challenges, okay. I mean, there's always, with all these things, with all projects, there's always a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I mean, obviously we don't have unlimited budget and unlimited capacity because for all these challenges you need you need your you need the business unit or the functional unit you need their process people because you need the actual experts who can design the processes who can look at what's working what's not working today yep. And then you have to make sure that you have the right technological platform tools and all that, that then fit seamlessly, ideally, into your organization. So, you know, those are some of the big challenges. And then the challenges are not to over-automate, like to automate those processes where it actually makes sense. Yeah. So pragmatically look, where does it make sense? And where is it sufficient to just, you know, optimize the process itself mm -hmm. without actually using technology and, and trying to do something there. Yeah. And then also, I think a big challenge is to try it out. And if you see that it doesn't work, to just stop it, mm -hmm. to not continue on and push and push and push. And finally, I think one of the challenges is to go from a pilot phase to scaling it up uh, to enough scale to actually reap the benefits that yeah. you had originally wanted to reap. So what's your strategy? Are you developing centers of expertise around this? Um, or are you, uh, is your view also that um, to everybody in the business should do their own development? And do you believe in citizens development for this as well? I think you have to look at it in a slightly more differentiated way. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it's necessary to have a center of excellence that also gives guidelines and decides on which technologies and which platforms are useful for which size of effort and all that. Yeah. And then we today have that. And then we also have decentralized centers of excellence, if you so will, or expertise. Yeah. Um, and so in that combination and with the, with the business together, I think it works, but you, 
and I mean, the goal would be to for the smaller automations that are very local that mm -hmm. that don't need to be scaled over the whole business because yep. the processes are very different to definitely uh, give tools so the business can do quick automations that really uh, solve a local pain, mm -hmm. but that can be done there because the tools and the guidelines are clear and it's clear um, how what you need to do so it's secure, what you need to do so it fits seamlessly into the environment and so on and mm -hmm. so on. So yes to all of it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> now you have the more enterprise tools like, like UiPath software and, 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 and other vendors out there. Um, but do you also believe that every white color in the organization will have their personal robot and that is something that will sit on everybody's laptop uh, in, in, in good times? It really, I think, depends on the job that that person is doing. Mm -hmm. I, I doubt that it will make sense that everybody has their own personal robot. Mm -hmm. uh, but depending on the job that they do, I'm sure that a large amount of people will come in contact with automated processes. Yeah. Okay. So, Kista, let's talk about the relationship between the CIO and the CFO. I know that you've been a CFO yourself uh, for a subsidiary of Deutsche Bahn. Uh, you're now a CIO, CDO, so you know both roles very, very well. In my view, in my humble uh, view on things, I sometimes look at the CIO as the innovator, as the, the digital champion, and I look at the CFO as the con more conservative, controlling factor in an organization. Is that correct? Is, the, is that how that is organized in many, in many companies today? It's a very good question. I think that, uh, first of all, the two roles are very complementary mm -hmm. because both the CIO has a complete overview of the company since at the end of the day, just about all the company's processes are coded into IT. Yeah. And the CFO has the complete overview of the company from the sort of KPI financial aspect of it. So I think that in itself is a very complementary relationship when you see the company from two different perspectives and that gives you the whole picture in the end. I guess by the nature of the job, the CIO, CDO is more innovative than the CFO, just because that's part of the job description <laughs> to see how can you modernize the company? How can you use, what technologies are out there? How can yep. you use it to, for the success of the company and yep. therefore for the customers? However, the CFOs that I've worked with or when I was CFO, I saw it as my role to also make the company successful. So therefore to question, uh, are we on the right path? Are we investing enough in the right things and so on? And so again, from that perspective, it, it fits together really yeah. well. Since only looking at it together, will you be able to drive the company to success? Yeah. But that's like a, a natural tension between the, the two roles a little bit, where this, the, the CIO likes to invest and try out new things. And the CFO said, but where's the return on investment? I, I, I need to get my, uh, my return or? I think it's a healthy tension. <laughs> Because obviously, I mean, I think most CIOs are very cost conscious since mm -hmm. it's uh, you're doing this for the business and not to build up a great IT landscape yep. uh, as, a, as uh, for itself, but really to, to make this business successful. Yep. Nevertheless, um, I think obviously the viewpoint is more on the technology and more on what the technology can actually offer. And sometimes also uh, when it's still quite young and you want to try it out. So mm -hmm. there's a necessary and obvious tension there where it's the role of the CFO to say, okay, but don't forget, we actually need a return on this investment. We actually need to see, will it really give us what we were hoping for? Yep. And how can we build in these checkpoints in between before we go full scale to make sure that it's going in the right direction? Okay. And, and if we uh, use that CIO, CFO combination, and we look at enterprise automation, who has which role there? Who's responsible in the end for automating the finance department and, and, and bringing in the, 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 the RPN, the software robots in there. How do you look at that? Again, I think uh, there's, there's uh, two sides to, to reaching that and to becoming successful with that. There's on the one hand, the CFO who's interested in, in uh, increasing the quality of the output of his areas, looking at how he can also reduce costs in his own area and all that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the role of the CIO in, in that area to actually make it happen. And to maybe come with ideas and say, see, when looking at the technology, we saw use cases in 
other companies, wouldn't that be interesting for us when, when looking at what the next level of the current systems is? We yep. saw that the next uh, systems are so much more automated and we could combine that with this and this. So, you know, I think it's both sides driving it forward. Now, since you have this double experience and, and I mean, see, I know we're a community of, of, of digital leaders. Uh, if you put on your head uh, of CFO, how would you advise the CIOs, the digital leaders, to interact with the CFO? How do they need to work with them? How do they need to make sure that they build the best possible relationship with them? I think one thing that is key is transparency. Mm -hmm. I, in my experience, years ago, like let's say 10 years ago, IT was still in this area of trying to well, maybe it wasn't, on, I'm sure it wasn't on purpose, but it seemed like people who talked about IT always showed how complex it was, how difficult it was, and how you needed to be a complete expert to even start to begin to understand what IT was doing and why it was doing that. And I don't think that's the right approach. I believe the right approach is to, to be very transparent in why you're doing what, what mm -hmm. systems, like how they work in a simplified way, obviously, and to be very transparent in what the costs are, what incurs the costs, what the levers for that is, for that those are, and also showing what the benefits are, yep. because you need benefits. And I mean, some things are indirect benefits because you need a data lake to then be able to digitize and use all that, yep. but there are benefits. and so. Be transparent, explain it, show how it all fits together, and, and show how all the areas of the company can benefit yeah. from it. But that's an interesting way to look at it. Eh? So you could say that 10 years ago, the CIO had the monopoly on IT and digital, and he was keeping everybody maybe a little bit in the dark on it. But nowadays, there has been an emancipation, and every CXO should be on, the, on, on a good level to understand the value of IT and, and, and digital, right? Absolutely. I think that's, that's a, a good way of summarize, summarizing that. And 10 years ago, I have the impression, and maybe that's wrong, but my impression from thinking back to then was that IT was more like, like showing what terrible things would happen if you don't invest in IT and not so much looking at the benefits side and simplifying in a way that's really understandable. Yeah. And now, I mean, we were talking about citizen development just a couple of minutes ago. Obviously, the trend needs to go towards more citizen development. It needs to go towards more general understanding. I believe the, the actual profile of managers in the future will always have certain aspects of IT. Yeah. I mean, look at HR, for example. There, there is no modern HR area anymore without a large IT component. Yep. And if it's just knowing how to use it and customize it, for example, but looking at business areas as well, I mean, operations, IT is everywhere. Almost no area today can really function effectively without a well-structured, well-architectured IT system. So absolutely. You have a master, you started in marketing, and then you went into finance. Um, becoming a CIO, a CDO, how difficult is that if, you don't, if you're not an engineer, if you don't have this, this hard tech background? Uh, we see more and more people from the business side becoming CIOs, uh, CIOs becoming CEOs or, or business. So it's, it's, there's more an exchange nowadays, but it's not necessarily easy, I can imagine, right? It's always interesting to ask someone who managed to get there if it was how difficult it was or not because yeah. i mean once you're there i always think my god i mean if, obviously it worked out so it couldn't have been that but how difficult. did you do it how did you do it it was it was a slow process to get there because uh, i mean the one thing that every job i did had in common was that it was very numbers based because sure i was in marketing but it was direct marketing mm -hmm. so you always analyzed all the returns, all the numbers, how many people actually uh, subscribed and so on and so on. So very, very numbers based. Yeah. And then uh, I went into strategy consulting, again, analyses, numbers, 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 numbers. And then I went into the project side of Deutsche Bahn, again, lots of projects, analysis, numbers, numbers. And then I went into finance, obviously numbers and analysis. Yeah. And then um, I went into the IT area first as CFO. And then after a year and asking too many questions, they made me the CEO of that area and I think you need to be interested in the technology side you need to have you need to be able to understand it uh, at least 
in a slightly simpli simplified way, yeah. reasonably easily. And I, in, in my experience, sometimes it helps not to have too much in-depth knowledge on certain topics as long as you understand the general and bigger picture yep. because then those who are in meetings with you have to explain it to you. And I noticed that when I actually ask questions, they have to explain it. Sometimes when they then simplified it down, they noticed that maybe they were going in the slightly wrong direction. Maybe they were making the problem too complex and it would they could actually simplify it much yep. more. So I think that's that's how you can manage to change your direction that way. There's certainly common ground. Mm -hmm. You have to have a basic understanding, be able to understand it uh, reasonably quickly, yep. and you have to have interest in it. But you have to earn the respect of the engineers of, of sure. and, and so on. So that's uh, so. so. Uh, I can do things that they can't <laughs> <laughs> since I have a different uh, background. Yeah, of <laughs> so course. you know, it's it's again complementary. So with your background and with your team of three thousand people, how do you? How would you define fundamentally your role? What is it that you spend most of your time with? I think most of my time, well, most of my time, I think my time is split between different topics. I spend quite a lot of time with my team discussing sort of the strategic direction, discussing what we want to achieve by when and what is necessary to, to get there. Yeah. I, in the last month, spend a lot of time with my team also discussing the operating model and how we need to evolve it over time in order to be able to react faster, become more flexible, to be able to actually deliver more for the customers and the business. Yeah. Then I spend my time on very operational topics, usually uh, more when things are going wrong <laughs> than <laughs> when they're actually working really well. Yeah. So obviously troubleshooting, uh, escalations that reach me and looking at what are the solutions yep. uh, around that. So those are topics in IT that, and uh, digitalization that I spend yep. my time on. And I spend my time obviously with my colleagues uh, in uh, general topics for Schenker, looking again at sort of uh, our strategic development, looking at what are specific issues inside of the business units, how can we assist from IT and digitalization standpoint, yep. how do we want to develop the company forwards and what is the like what can IT and digitalization do to make sure that that will be successful. Okay. That, let's talk a little bit about IT and digital at DB Schenker. Uh, I understand you have a, a, a big team, 3,000 people that uh, take care of it on different levels, international, regional level, country level, and so on. Give me a little bit a picture of how uh, you have organized or how IT and digital is organized in the company today. So basically, we have a matrix organization, I suppose. I mean, with a large, uh, reasonably complex company like ours, I think yep. the matrix is the only way you can actually cover different aspects of it. Um, we have uh, the, the business unit IT mm -hmm. uh, heads. So for, say, uh, Air Ocean, I have an IT head. For mm -hmm. land, I have an IT head. For contract logistics. And I also have CIOs in the big regions. So uh, APAC, Europe, and Americas. Mm -hmm. um, and they have an organization under them as well. Okay. Um, and Additionally, I have a global organization. So things like infrastructure is organized globally with a head of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, governance is organized globally and has some counterparts uh, in the regions to make yep. sure that the guidelines are, are um, clear to everyone and are being followed and things like that. So it's, it's a mixture between core IT that is organized globally and then regional IT and uh, business unit IT as a matrix. Okay. And we have our, sorry, our technology centers uh, that we have bundled expertise in and also software development and things like that in different locations. And so let's talk about 2022. What, is the, what are your main programs for uh, today? Is that in security? Is that into ERP? Is that into cloud? What, what, what's, where, is, where is your focus on, 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 on major access, let's say? Wow, that's, you think that's a small question, but really, <laughs> obviously, in a large organization like ours, it's a really broad I, spectrum I imagine, of, yeah, of, of course, our, yeah. our programs. I mean, let, let's start with the basics. I mean, uh, we are obviously um, a company that's been around for 150 years, so our IT has been around for as long as IT has been around, yeah. like grown along with the company. So uh, we always have large modernization programs running. Um, and so we have several running right now. Uh, 
we, as most people, are obviously uh, in the midst of our S4HANA migration project. We have a large uh, modernization project starting up in the HR area. Um, we are continuously modernizing our TMSs, or so our transport management systems, yep. uh, and so on and so on. So that is obviously one big focus that we yep. continue on evolving our general... Making sure that the legacy doesn't <laughs> grow and the technical debt doesn't grow. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yep. Uh, we are quite far in our cloud migration, so all the big systems have been migrated now for quite some time. Um, but we are migrating now more of the local servers. That's uh, still a program accelerating to cloud and looking at how we how we go forward there mm -hmm. uh, and make sure that uh, we become more and more standardized and harmonized uh, yep. when it comes to that. Uh, we are uh, looking at uh, continuing our journey towards an agile organization. We have large areas that work in a very agile way with the business, but not all areas yet. So yep. we are looking at how do we now, what's the next area to expand that to? Because we see absolute benefits in working closely with the business in joint teams mm -hmm. and driving forward uh, all the topics in that way. Yep. Then um, let me think, uh, obviously, uh, cybersecurity that you just mentioned is always a topic that's an ongoing program. It's becoming always. more and more important, apparently, no? It, I don't think uh, it's becoming more and more important. I think it's just <laughs> becoming, people are becoming more and more aware of it, I think is more the, the thing with that. So obviously, yep. we're continuing with that. Um, we, uh, we, on the digitization side, uh, we are looking at um, continuing to scale certain topics uh, in IoT, in automation, and, and topics like that to also uh, increase the usage of our customer-facing platforms, uh, like uh, uh, things like that, and also looking at where do we need to expand that, where are new topics that we then need to go towards. So it's, it's a very broad range. Yep, I can imagine. <laughs> and why is it that, I mean, there's a skill shortage, right? I can imagine here just as well as, as, as in many uh, other organizations around uh, around the globe. So why would people come and work in your team? What is special about it? How do you make uh, IT fun in, the, in DB Schenker? First of all, Schenker is a cool company to work for. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had it earlier. Last two years, I think everybody became so much more aware that logistics is one of the things that keeps the world running, keeps the world moving. Because without logistics, when, when logistics change, supply chains start to crumble, all of us feel that in our daily life. So I think logistics is a fascinating field. It's a very, very global company with lots of opportunities all over. And IT is in the heart of a lot of this. Then uh, in addition, so working for us means inside IT, you're actually seeing how your, your IT solutions are being used in day-to-day -day work. You can go and, and almost touch it. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, we we are moving much more towards a more agile way of working. So it's a it's a fast faster moving environment. It's a more innovative environment mm -hmm. with all different aspects. And on the other hand, I think companies are interesting that actually have a broad spectrum of technologies yep. because I mean there's so many different IT people with so many different interests. Some love the really new stuff and trying it out and driving it forward. Yep. Some find satisfaction in keeping the more legacy stuff running and figuring out how you can do that even if really, in theory, it shouldn't be running anymore and things like that. So I think we have a really broad spectrum to offer anybody who, who's interested. Let's talk a little bit more about you. And, and let's first start with talking about your management style. How do you make your team successful? What's your secret of success there? Good question. Secret of success. <laughs> I don't believe there's ever one secret of success. I think uh, to make a team successful, you need to first make it into a team. And mm -hmm. that's a matter of actually, you know, getting everybody involved, uh, working out what our mutual goals are, looking at how that fits into the company goals, mm -hmm. uh, defining what every single person's role is in that, mm -hmm. and, and really driving it together, driving it forward together and not mm -hmm. just as individuals. So in a way, breaking up the, the extreme silos that often exist even inside a company mm -hmm. and making sure that everybody is aware how the areas need to work together and how they interlink in order to yep. be successful. So I think that's the basis for success, making sure that it is actually a team and not people working against each other. Yep. Then I believe 
the involvement is a secret of success, that people feel heard and involve, are involved in, in working out what the strategy is supposed to be, what the details of the strategy are mm -hmm. supposed to be, and get direct feedback and, and are in this discussion. Um, so those are two big things, definitely. Yeah. Now you have management and then you have leadership. Mm. So how would you describe your leadership style? How, what's, what's, and, and what is the role of the CIO, CDO as, as a leader in the organization, in, in your view? How would I describe my leadership style? I think my leadership style is uh, one where, where I look forward and I, I paint the big picture. Mm -hmm. And I also, I also try to be very open and transparent about how it all fits together and what our challenges are and how that fits into the big picture going forward. Mm -hmm. I believe that uh, the more information, as long as I'm allowed to share it, the more information any individual has, the better they can actually do their job because the more they understand how what is important about their role in the overall picture, yeah. the better they will be working, the more successful they will be and the whole company will be. If I would go back to Deutsche Bahn, where you were uh, at a, at a, at a uh, role as, as CIO as well, what do you think people say about you there, about your leadership uh, that you had there as CIO? How do you think people perceive you as a leader? I would guess they would probably think of me more as the CEO of the IT company there, mm -hmm. since that's where, like, that's the... Uh, pretty large company and uh, where I changed the most because I I led that IT company in a complete transformation from a very Tayloristic, hierarchical, mm -hmm. traditional company to a self-organized organization where yep. we truly changed everything and, and changed all uh, well, everybody moved into the self-organization yep. with agile principles. And at the same time, we changed the technological base by taking everything into the cloud that is possible. So I think they would see me as a uh, courageous uh, person, as someone who <laughs> keeps on saying, we need to be more radical. If we do it, we need to you know, jump further and not just a little okay. bit. Uh, but also someone who, who uh, was passionate about driving that forward. So you're a change maker. Oh. At least and, for the last and, couple and of is, years. Is, does that have to do with your 50% American genes? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean I'm, I'm not no, German. No, my German side just got insulted <laughs> on that one. <laughs> no, but I mean, Germany, you're known for being well organized and maybe more traditionally organized. And I kind of imagine that the American and the international style uh, stirred things up a little bit here. Is, is, is that right to say like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I look back to, to our change process that we went through over a really quite a lot of years, uh -huh. you'd be surprised which of those people were the actual change drivers inside the organization. Uh -huh. Because, I mean, the, the, the approach we chose was to activate as many people as possible in the organization and to not just have a top-down movement, but also yep. a bottom-up movement. And I have to say, I mean, I, one of the guys who from the beginning drove the actual cultural change is um, a guy who, who is a civil servant. One of the few that's, I mean, that's, there, there are new, new ones inside DB. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's been with DB for decades and he was one of the big drivers and proponents of actually changing the culture and the way of working and all that. Yeah. And nobody just from a CV would ever think that. Yeah. And the other guy who, who was in the dual lead for, for that work stream was somebody who had worked deep in the IT operations for many, many years. And when I nominated him to be the dual lead, he just stared at me and went, why on earth would you nominate me? I'm like, come on, just try it out. And he, in the end, I mean, he just bloomed and loved it and really also drove it forward and was mm -hmm. very, very engaged. So no, I think uh, it's it's more a matter of, of interacting with people, of giving them some freedom when you have the general direction down and discuss that, mm -hmm. giving them freedom to actually work it out and drive it forward. And obviously you have to find the right people who really want to do it, but yep. there are a lot of them out there. And what is it that drives you? Because I mean, this is a, a demanding job, I can imagine. And so, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. So, Krista, what is it that really drives you? When at the end of the week are you really happy and with, with what happened in the, in the organization? What drives me? I think actually 
seeing that that we're changing things for the better, seeing that we are we are delivering for our customers out there and for the business, mm -hmm. seeing that you know any project, any topic that you drive forward will always you know start stumbling a bit and always have some roadblocks but seeing that we are able to like that people are motivated and that they are driving forward and and removing those roadblocks and that more and more people are you know taking the responsibility and truly mm -hmm. looking at what is best for the company and driving it forward and to be part of that and to be able to you know have their backs and say okay that's the direction i have your backs if there's issues that really motivates me and, and drives me forward let's talk about a bit more about your personality you shared with us your MBTI profile. You said I should take it, and there you go. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> and the test said that you are an ENTP, ENTJ. An ENTJ, also known as a commander. And commanders are decisive people that love momentum and accomplishment. And they gather information to construct their creative visions, but rarely hesitate for long before acting on them. Let's first talk about the positive side of, <laughs> <laughs> of commanders. People of this type, their strengths typically are that they're efficient, that they are energetic, self-confident, strategic thinkers, charismatic, and inspiring. How does, that, how, how does that feel? Do you relate to that? Let me take one step back. When I read that it was called Commander, I immediately thought my three brothers would be on the floor laughing themselves silly had they heard <laughs> that because they, they always thought that that, that's correct. Mm. <laughs> so therefore, um, I suppose, yeah, I think uh, a lot of a lot of that rings true. I'm sure yeah. it rings true for many people, even if they might have a slightly different uh, uh, set of uh, of uh, um, characteristics. Characteristics, yeah. but I, yeah, I, I think that uh, at least by and large. Okay, that fits the bill. Now, the more interesting part is. <laughs> Are, are the weaknesses. The, the weaknesses <laughs> and the development areas. Because, I mean, the other things come natural to you. I mean, being energetic and self-confident and so that comes natural to you. But some people with your personality profiles, they are sometimes stubborn, dominant, impatient, arrogant, and they don't handle emotions very well. Of course, you can't have these because you have this tough job. And, and so you can't be poor in handling emotions. You can't be arrogant, but I'm sure you had some of these before. So how do you, which one resonates of these weaknesses and how did you overcome them? I think some of them definitely resonate. Uh, if you're someone who wants to drive things forward, who likes discussing and analyzing things and, and uh, it, I believe can I can do that reasonably quickly and mm -hmm. understand the situation, then patience is not necessarily something that comes easily. Yeah. So I, I definitely have to say that over the years, you know, I, I did have to um, work on myself to, in mm -hmm. certain situations, you know, breathe deeply, let the other person explain, not jump in immediately, not immediately think I know what, where they're heading, what they're going to say, yeah. but first hear them out and ask questions instead of saying, oh, okay, I understood, so let's do it this way. Yeah. But to, you know, give the space to first ask questions and then yeah. let them present it properly. But how did, how did you learn that? Because, I mean, you're more rational than emotional. So I can imagine that working with people and getting things done from people was a domain that you had to learn because you're more analytical. You told it's data, facts, numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but, there you go. But, it, but it's people. I mean, you can only be successful with your people and, and, and obviously you do that very well. So, so how and when did you learn that to, be, to work in a good way with, with your teams and with your people? I think it's, uh, it's something that I learned quite a long time ago since uh, project work, like as a consultant, that's mm -hmm. always with a team, with people, and mm -hmm. under high pressure with long hours. So working in that high pressure environment already, you see how it helps a lot to go for dinner in the evening, have a glass of wine together, celebrate the successes, mm -hmm. uh, and so on, and to you know cut each other slack every now and then. Yep. Um, so I think it started there, but at the end of the day, to learn anything along your working life, the feedback is the important thing. and. Mm -hmm. I think it's easier when you're younger and not quite as high positions to actually receive feedback. Yeah. Not because it's harder to now receive feedback, but they're just less people who actually give you feedback. So it's very helpful to get feedback, very constructive feedback, and to every now and then uh, reflect on that 
mm -hmm. and see tell you how it's going. Since at the end of the day, nobody's going to get rid of their challenging areas, their learning areas, but we can all be more aware of it and set ourselves up for f to to notice when we're reacting in a certain yeah. way and then be able to adjust better in the moment. Now we talked about your management style, about your leadership style, of your personality uh, characteristics. Let's go one level deeper and let's talk about your values. What would you consider are the core belief systems, the core values that you live by? And I know you have, you have a stepdaughter. What is the, the values that you give on to your family and the people around you? I think core values include things like, well, I, in the work environment, I will first trust that people actually want to achieve something, want to be successful, want to mm -hmm. help accomplish something inside the company and are working, working towards it together and are not working against the, the joint success. Mm -hmm. So I value directness and, and uh, transparency mm -hmm. and honesty in that sense. I value a certain amount of loyalty, which goes hand in hand with that, in my opinion, because if you're transparent and honest, then mm -hmm. that's usually <laughs> goes hand in hand with that. Um, so I think it's, it's those kind of values and, and, uh, and having, knowing where the line and the dirt is of what you are willing to do and where it just is wrong in, your, in, in the way you see the world. Mm -hmm. I think that also helps. Okay. Let's talk a little bit how you developed as a professional and as a person. Were there mentors in your life, people that you look up to, people that you Im learned important lessons from? And, and could you maybe share one or two of these? Mm. I had a, if you want to call it mentor, but someone who, who really, uh, who I worked with for almost a decade, who mm -hmm. believed that I could do more and would, you know, uh, push me into the next job and, and, and accompany me along there. And I think one of the things that... Uh, I really liked in his his leadership style or management style was that he was he he communicated a lot like he mm -hmm. would that's as I was saying earlier like uh, the, the fact of like any information that you can share he shared so that we always knew what the big picture was we always knew what was going on which helped us even if our job was a much smaller one to actually do our job well because we knew how it fit into the big picture so that mm -hmm. was one person and one and one example where I thought, yeah, that's that's a really well, really good way of doing it because it really brings the other people with you. Okay. Do you have a personal mantra, a saying, in that in difficult times you can use that or that you live by? I think not explicitly, mm -hmm. but uh, I think uh, I think one thing that it, that might be a kind of mantra, but I, that I more noticed in in. Uh, interviews when people say so um, uh, what was something that that's like uh, that uh, was, was it called uh, that really went wrong and and it's I find it very hard to say because there's very few examples where something went wrong and that was the end mm -hmm. usually you solve it and you push forward and you solve it and you continue working on it until it's successful so and one and then the bad thing sort of fades so it's hard to remember those kind of things and I think that's in a way a kind of mantra or at least an outlook on life to say, okay, it might be bad, but let's find the good thing in it and let's find a way forward. Okay. That's definitely, I think, <laughs> characteristic. Now you brought the next question up and that's my favorite question. Yeah, let's and try is, it. <laughs> I mean, you're obviously very, very successful, but everybody makes their mistakes. Oh, sure. Um, so what was your most brilliant failure that you in your career have ever done and what did you learn from it? I mean. I love that question. It just sounds so nice, <laughs> even. Absolutely. But it's also really, really difficult to uh -huh. answer. Also mm -hmm. because you know, failure seems so final. Um, oh, so I mean, we need to fail fast <laughs> nowadays. So failure is accepted. I know, but that's why. So and mistakes. But I was thinking about it, and I thought back to to a company that I was working for, and we were we were looking at how to turn around the company, and mm -hmm. we, we had to really analyze how were operations working. I was there as a CFO, how were the operations work and all that. And we had this head of operations. Um, uh, I was in the board of management. We had this head of operations, and he was this really brilliant guy, and he, he we all trusted him, and that, uh, that I think, uh, to, to trust him and not ask enough questions was the big mistake that I and we made because he would like have all these analysis and write everything down, whatever. And then 
bit by bit over the months, we noticed more and more that his team wasn't really happy because he'd have these bizarre meeting hours. And then we noticed that though it was all logical what he was saying, the fact base wasn't really there, mm-hmm. and so on and so on. And it ended up with uh, him having to leave his, his position because it just wasn't tenable anymore. And <laughs> we noticed that there wasn't a single actual document where all these things he had been telling us for months was actually documented and the concept was actually spelled out because the computer he handed in had nothing on it. So that, that was that was a very interesting learning experience to to give someone the trust and have these intense discussions just to notice that it was all logical but slightly built on quicksand. Okay, so you learn trust is important but also do your d- controls <laughs> and checks is important as well. And ask the right well. questions. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> If you look back at, at your personal life, professional life, what was maybe one of the best things that has ever happened to you? I think having the opportunity to work abroad for so many years in so many different uh, companies, but also study abroad, mm-hmm. I think that was fantastic because I met so many people, learned so much, was able to live in countries. And even if like I, my first job, I started off in Sweden. I had never been to Sweden before until I went there to to sign the contract to start as a trainee there. Yeah. And I always thought, oh, Sweden is so similar to Germany. Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's not. In some ways, of course, but in many ways it's not. So just to, to have this eye-opening experience from even a country where you think it's so similar and then go yeah. to so many different ones, that was fantastic. Okay. Now, a bit more personal question maybe, but in your life, what is it that you fear most? And what is it that you love most? I fear most losing close family and friends, and I love most my close family and friends. Okay. So family is important. Friends are important. Very. So, what, I mean, you have, like we said, you have a very busy job. What is it that you do outside of work? Where, where, is, where is your passion outside of work? That's so interesting. I read this article the other day about uh, um, the word hobby. And this guy who was going on and on about, so I feel so deficient because I have no hobby. I'm interested in many things and, then I, and I can't really say reading and meeting friends and traveling as a hobby. No. And so I, I sort of read that and it resonated to a certain extent because mm-hmm. um, passion. I, I love meeting up with uh, friends. Uh, I love traveling to where they live and, mm-hmm. and spending time with them there. I love reading, but something like, uh, I don't know, that I'm into uh, these model trains or something, <laughs> that, no. <laughs> and what is it that you read? Is there any, any specific domain that you're more interested in? Yeah, urban fantasy. Urban <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> if you want to know the truth, because it is one of the most relaxing things ever. I read all sorts of other things as well, but okay. if I really want to relax, and I, I prefer reading to watching TV, and it takes you completely away from reality. And if it's well written, it's, it's just so capturing so that it, when you're reading, you can't do anything else. When you're watching okay. TV, you can quickly do this chore, quickly do that. But when you're reading and something that's engaging, you just... Totally somewhere else. So that's else. how you get into the moment outside of normal, of yep. professional life and so on. So Kista, we always end these interviews uh, with asking our talent uh, what their advice is that they would give to the younger self or to future digital leaders. So with all your experience from marketing to projects to finance to IT uh, to leadership, if people that are watching this uh, video and that also want to be in your shoes, <laughs> what is the advice that you would give them? I think there's several pieces of advice. Follow your curiosity. Mm-hmm. So take the opportunities, go and do it, get over your slightly slight fear. And if you believe that you can be at least, there's a 50% chance at least that you can be successful in a job, that's sufficient, go for it and do it. So that, mm-hmm. that would be like, like uh, some of the advice. And then when I was at business school, um, I, you know, in the second year, you have to also do a fun course. So I took a course called Culture, Communication and Change. So a little bit of foofy, but fun, mm-hmm. but interesting as well. And in that course, there was a professor, a guest professor who came and he said to us, you know, let me give you one piece of advice. As fast as you possibly can, you need to save three to five monthly salaries because that's your walk away money. So if in your career you get come into a situation where 
you either ethically or for whatever situation you say, I, this is really not me, I can't do it, I won't do it, you can walk away because you have three to five monthly salaries, yep. hidden, not hidden away, but saved away that give you the freedom to walk if it is totally goes against your grain, goes against your beliefs. And I have to say that was one of the most liberating and freeing pieces of advice and of advice. And I would, that would be the advice for any young person if they can save up the money so that you have the, the, freedom. the, the freedom that you can, you know, that you can stick by your beliefs and that you can walk if you have to. Okay. And with this, Krista, I would like to thank you for uh, your hospitality, for it was a pleasure being here and doing face-to-face -face interviews again, and for your, uh, for your time and for sharing all your good ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun.